As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have an important returning guest today, Rob Kirby, founder of KirbyAnalytics.com, uh, experienced commentator and, and analyst of the precious metals and uh, financial markets, is here back with us on Reluctant Preppers. Rob, thanks for joining us again. Pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. We had you uh, about a month ago, and you... Uh, opened our eyes to what you called the epic battle between globalists and sovereign states. And if we could have you now in the wake of the Brexit vote in the UK and other people saying that this may well spill over or have start a domino effect, it certainly was a uh, shock to many people, even though the polls were coming back close to 50-50 uh, odds uh, heading into it, there seemed to be almost a uh, inevitable shift to people saying, oh, after all, the, the status quo is going to prevail and the, and the polls seemed to start sliding towards there was not going to be an exit but a stay vote. And uh, to many people's surprise, that's not the way things went and it even led to an announcement of a departure by the prime minister and so on. So if you could uh, first start us off by telling us what in the world uh, happened there and then let's talk about why that's important. What does it mean? Is this, you know, the beginning of a, a sea change or a tipping point in this epic battle that you uh, described to us last time? Well, uh, I think in a nutshell, uh, Dunnigan, people uh, the world over are beginning to awaken uh, largely because of the alternative press um, and they're beginning to awaken to the fact that the globalist uh, control base uh, that's been ruling our planet for the last number of, uh, let's just say somewhere between 40 and 60 years, uh, who have agendas, uh, and, and their agendas are not very, let's just say not humanity friendly. Uh, and and uh, in their own white papers, if you go back and read them through the years uh, and the writings of people like Kissinger, Brzezinski, Murray Strong, these, people's, uh, these people have expressed uh, contempt for humanity. Um, and they're taking us, or trying to take us at least, down a course or down a path where we arrive at something, uh, as, as I've said many times and others have said it, they want one world government, they want one world currency, they want one world religion, namely the worship of state itself. And this phenomena has finally reached, uh, you use the word a tipping point, where people are awakening to the fact, uh, George Carlin said it really well in, in, uh, in one of his comedy routines, that it's a big club and we ain't in it, so to speak. And the the uh, vote in, in Britain to to leave the European Union, in my view, is an anti-globalist uh, vote, and we're seeing it paralleled in other European nations where there is a, a let's just say a healthy amount of skepticism about the viability of the European Union going forward, and we're also seeing this phenomena this. Uh, being manifested in, in the United States as well. Uh, and that's been manifested or expressed by the rise in populism uh, as the popularity of Donald Trump has grown. Um, Donald Trump, uh, whatever else he might be, Donald Trump is anti-globalist. Donald Trump has said that he would not allow America to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He has said that he might have a good, good hard look at ripping up uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And Donald Trump is an American nationalist, uh, whether you love him or hate him. And that is seen as a severe threat to this globalist movement. And that is why the mainstream or the status quo hates him with the passion they do. Um, they hate him as much as, as they as they hate the decision that was made in Britain last Friday. So the, the globalists have some uh, certainly have some roadblocks in their way at the moment, 
uh, from from my standpoint, uh, I I hope that the globalists are defeated in their in their wanton uh, to bring us to towards a one world government. I don't see how a one world government and uh, and, and the dissolving of sovereign borders serves humanity in in any manner, shape, or form. Because to me, it's uh, to me, it's uh, totalitarianism taken to the very, very extreme. So that's where I think we're at. When you talk about people feeling uh, somewhat en- encouraged or empowered uh, that they may have a voice against the globalists, um, it it seems to echo the uh, the disenfranchisement that people were expressing uh, in the uh, selection of candidates for the American presidential race, uh, where the major parties were basically informing people that that, uh, they were under a misconception if they thought that the people, the populists, chose the candidates versus the party insiders, the party bosses choosing the candidates. Here, uh, I think there's been some skepticism, even after the Brexit vote on the part of, as as encouraging of a sign as it seems, some people have said, I know I heard David Quinturi uh, uh, commenting on this and, and others, that there can be procedural delays and there can be uh, other ways that the status quo can take this under advisement or whatever, but it may not actually result in, in England actually exiting the EU. Is that? Do you see that that is a realistic possibility or is that just sort of delaying the inevitable and, it, and it's a done deal? In, in my view, the European Union experiment is, is, was flawed from its inception. There are countries that were admitted into the union who never qualified under their under their own uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, Italy never qualified, but isn't it interesting? You see the, the way these the way these globalists work things. Italy, Italy never really qualified for inclusion in the euro under guidelines laid down by the Maastricht Treaty, and uh, but Italy at the time had a had a finance minister named Mario Draghi. And Mr. Draghi played some tricks uh, with sovereign Italian gold, where he leased a whole pile of sovereign Italian gold and invested the proceeds with a company called Long- Long-Term Capital Management. And then Long-Term Capital Management went and made a very, very huge leverage bet on Russian bonds. And Russia defaulted on the bonds, and then Long-Term Capital lost a whole lot of money and were indeed bankrupt. And that's when that's when the the marvelous master Jim Rickards came to the came to the uh, came to the fore as the chief legal counsel of long-term capital management uh, uh, he was he was brought in to be the point man for a secretive bailout of long-term capital and the reason a secret bailout had to be had to be made was because if the world had known that Italy had leased gold, uh, where the gold leaves the vault and goes, it gets sold into the market, and then invested the proceeds with long-term capital. Uh, um, you see that that fit very well with with another one of the globalist uh, 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 intentions is to cap or, or suppress the price of precious metal to make to make fiat money look brilliantly strong and, and like like it's uh, good and good and sound. Uh, if, 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 if a very public workout of long-term capital had occurred and it had been exposed that hundreds of tons of gold, Italian gold, had been sold into the market, not only would Italy have not qualified for the euro, the euro concept back then probably would have been stillborn and there wouldn't have been a euro. And uh, Mr. Rickards, uh, the globalist he is, uh, or the globalist wannabe fool, uh, he 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 served he served his masters very well by hiding the details from public consumption of of the bailout of long term capital and 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 it's so interesting uh, in that bailout uh, all the participants were all sworn to secrecy and anybody who ever worked for long term capital wasn't allowed to talk to anybody and still and still don't and are not allowed to and you can only imagine what they've been threatened with if they ever come forward and say what really happened but the entrails are there and uh you know i've done my own work in that area and i know and i know what happened and mr rickards knows what happened too and this is why mr rickards can walk around the planet saying that the gold is such a great buy well mr rickards was Mr. Rickards was was you know responsible for one of the biggest gold swindles that ever or had 
in intimate knowledge of one of the biggest gold swindles. And he knows that the price of gold is capped because he knows he knows that basically Italy, uh, with guidance from Goldman Sachs, w was was leasing gold and and using the gold freed up to uh, sell it into the market. So anyway, it's look the globalists the globalists have had a good run, but they ha they have a very flawed they have a very flawed platform. Uh, uh, as Italy didn't didn't qualify under master treaty guidelines. Uh, Greece also did not qualify to become uh, a, a member of the Eurozone. But after, after Goldman Sachs came to Greece's aid and greased their books with a whole pile of derivatives, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, the, the pig had enough lipstick that, you know, it snuck in under the wire. But, I mean, Greece should never have been uh, on merit uh, included in the Eurozone. Financially, they just didn't cut it. So, you know, this, these are the games the globalists have been playing. And the funny thing is, when you go around, basically, when you live your life screwing everybody, things catch up to you. And things are catching up to the globalists. They're underhanded, insider dealing, front running uh, 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 of everything that moves, and, and basically giving a screw job to humanity. Sometimes, you know, it, uh, it comes back on you. And it's coming back on them now. People are waking up. People get it. And just because the dinosaur uh, press won't report these things, people like you, people like Alex Jones, people, people like, uh, uh, you know, there's a host of them. Like, uh, people are willing to talk about it. And increasingly, Donegan, uh, People are not getting, look at the ratings of, of, of the dinosaur press. Look at the ratings that, that uh, you know, the, 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 the CNNs and the CNBCs and the ABCs, all these, all these sycophantic uh, mainstream outlets, that, like, they're, 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 their ratings are in the toilet. They've lost their audience. They don't speak for anything anymore other than, you know, they do, they do still have uh, an endless loop of basically lies that they play or misdirection or, or, or partial truths. But people increasingly are, are going to the internet and uh, ferreting out what, you know, the, the chafe and, and there's, there's, there's wheat and chafe in the alternative press too, but at least you get, you get a, you get a full sounding and you get, and you get both sides of the story and you can, you know, people, it's amazing when people are allowed to make their own decisions when they're provided with good facts or, or, or with, a, with a broad picture, people can make their own uh, decisions. And that's, that's something that the globalists just don't think we're entitled to do. Because it was, I think it was the uh, head of the East, uh, European Parliament, I, I believe today I was reading, that he, he, he had made some comment uh, similar to what the Republican leadership in your country uh, said that uh, co commoners commoners aren't really allowed to vote for what they want. It's, it's, it's the elite technocrats that make all the decisions for us and then, and then just jam them down our throats. And we're supposed to be okay with that. Are you okay with that, Dunnigan? <laughs> I'm certainly not. But a, a lot of people have characterized the, the, the mass uh, population as being um, hopelessly ignorant and hopelessly out of touch with what's really going on, only only interested in their latest entertainment uh, and that sort of thing. But does this Brexit vote uh, reveal, uh, as well as perhaps the Greek rejection of, of uh, uh, earlier um, conditions uh, from the Eurozone, that sort of thing, that, as you say, the common people, ignorant as they may be on average or whatever, are still... Uh, getting it and at least getting understanding that uh, they've been left out of the decision making process and, and taking steps to um, to express you know their their rejection of that and but will in your view will that make a difference w will it actually stick will, will this brexit vote let's just start with that specific example do you in your view will that actually uh, take take hold and actually uh, work out that way or will it somehow be thwarted and undermined by the powers that be well I, I believe that the powers that be will try to undermine and and, and make the uh, the historic vote irrelevant um, but 
on the other hand, um, I, I do think there is an awakening big enough that these, these globalists, these elitists have huge problems on their hands now. And I, I think that, I think that the, if you, if, if we can even, if we can even say that the, that the Brexit vote was started a, uh, started a, you know, a fire, uh, other fires are going to be started in short order as well, if they aren't already. Um, and pretty soon, the, the globalists are going to have too many fires to fight and not enough resources to fight them all. So, yes, I think, I think what occurred on Friday, I believe it's a game changer. Um, I believe that there's probably a list of four or five other countries in, in the European zone that are... are you know, or regions that are, that are likely going to uh, move along with some sort of a an idea, or 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 or, or uh, others are going to follow. That's just it. And it it took it took it took somebody it took somebody to say enough is enough already. And and because you know what, everybody's feeling it. The rise of nationalism. And the, the rise of populism is an idea. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have, have been thinking, me included, that, you know, maybe Trump, maybe Trump gets eliminated, assassinated, or, or whatever. And, and how arrogant it is, at least in my view, to think that, uh, you know, what's going on in America is all about Trump. I mean, Trump, Trump is just the manifestation of an idea, and the idea is, is the rise of populism or nationalism, and ideas are bulletproof. And frankly, frankly, getting rid of Trump at this point, and maybe they've come to that conclusion, getting rid of Trump would probably only hasten the process. Uh, the, the globalists, in my view, with their contempt for humanity, are likely, are likely to do something a lot more heinous than simply... Uh, uh, you know, assassinate Trump. Like maybe they'll nuke a city. Uh, maybe they'll take us take us to a bigger war. Uh, maybe they'll uh, foment some sort of a racial incident uh, uh, and, and declare martial law and cancel the elections. Uh, you know, these people these people think in very very dark dark ways. And and they 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 employ very dark dark methods and means to achieve their goals, and with their contempt for humanity, they really don't care how many of us they liquidate in the process. Because in the grand scheme of things, their true intention is to see the population of this planet go from plus seven billion down to something in the neighborhood of five hundred million. So they want to get rid of ninety percent of us anyway. So anybody who has it in their head. That they wouldn't pull off something that's would that that would be like massive in terms of bloodletting and, and killing. Uh, all I suggest is you think again and 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 open your mind up uh, to some of the things that have already occurred. That basically, in my view, anyway, and to many others' uh, point of view, have global fingerprints all over them. If you could take us there just for a moment, because to a lot of people whom, who this might be new information to, they may have no, they hear the word globalist and they get the basic idea is, okay, it means uh, more global cooperation between uh, countries. And perhaps when you say one world government, one world currency, it doesn't sound all that bad. I think about the, uh, the uh, it's a small world ride at uh, Disney World or the uh, festivals of nations, those sort of things where it seems like, you know, fraternity, brotherhood, everybody appreciating each other's costumes and dances and all getting along just fine. So there's that there's that spin that the common person may have thinking globalism is all about uh, camaraderie. Um, but if you could uh, tell us when we're describing this to the common person that we meet, whether it's at work or in our neighborhood or in our family, why should they care about uh, uh, the, the true implications, the real, where it's going to actually impact their lives if uh, globalists uh, get their way? What, does, what difference will it make to them if you could take it down to the sort of the individual uh, country and then to the individual uh, person and family? Well, let's, uh, let, let's, let's, let's get right to it then. Uh, here's a news headline from two days ago. If people want to know what all this globalist stuff really means, 
Uh, how about how about uh, columns of UN uh, military vehicles and troops uh, being spotted in uh, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina as recently as two days ago? Now, if 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 your listening audience who live in America are okay with United Nations uh, military. Uh, 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 you know, exercises going on in, in, in their in their states. Well, you know, frankly, uh, I don't want to see no UN you, no UN military hardware uh, parading down streets in Canada. I, I I don't think Americans are ready for that yet. And uh, you know, like my attitude is, tell the UN to go back home where they come from, because you know what, uh, uh, this and this this. This is all the embodiment of the rise of this nationalism or the populism. Uh, you know, I think Americans, most Americans believe that Americans can work out their own issues and their own problems. And they don't need the United Nations, they don't need boots of the United Nations soldiers on their, on their territory to, to sort out their issues. The issues that your country have all emanate from Washington, which is corrupt and rotten beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm not picking on America because, you know what, the, 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 the top of my country is rotten and corrupt beyond a shadow of a doubt, too. But, you see, the whole idea about this, the rise of this populism and the awakening of people is that people get it in their heads that, you know, they can fend for themselves. And, uh, you know, your country, has, your country has proud traditions and a wonderful constitution which seems to have been ignored or put on the back burner or, or been, uh, uh, you know, largely ignored by the last few rounds of leadership uh, over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years in your country. And uh, I don't like the direction my country is going in either because it seems to me that Canadian leadership has been all too willing to sign on to these global trade. They're, 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 they're called global trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, like the North American Free Trade Agreement, like the Peace and Prosperity Arrangement between Canada, Mexico, and, you, and yourselves. You know, these, these trade pacts, what they, what they actually do is they usurp sovereignty from the countries who sign them, and they, they move, the, they move the, the, the ability to create law or enforce law or to make new law, they, they take it away from our legislative uh, uh, establishments like your, your House of Congress or your Senate or our Parliament in Canada, and they put the power that should rest with the people who, who send representatives to these institutions to represent them. It, it, it takes, takes those powers and it moves them to corporate board boards where where people are, aren't elected aren't accountable to anyone and and it's 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 basically it's the it, it's fascism in its you know in its completeness it's the merger of, of state and and business and and it's and it's taking and, it, and you, you can't argue that that you're not usurping the the sovereignty of a country when you take the ability to make and enforce laws out of the hands of people who are, uh, you know, representative of the people, and put them with, and put them with, uh, uh, you know, groups groups of corporatists who aren't elected, and these deals that you know the the most recent one, the the peace and prosper, sorry, the the Trans Pacific Partnership. This thing has been negotiated has been being negotiated for the last three and a half years. Nobody in Congress was ever allowed to see it. While they were negotiating it, this thing was never vetted in our in our in, in Canada in our in our Parliament. These these things are just being unilaterally done in secret, and then and then we're told if we want to find basically we're told if we want to find out what what the contents of these of these packs are, we have to sign them. Well, you know what? That dog doesn't hunt, as far as I'm concerned. And it seems to me that there's a growing plurality of people who realize that when people are negotiating things in secret that we're not allowed to be told about, they usually aren't very good for us. Those words, uh, we have to 
sign it to find out what's in it is uh, echoes the words of Nancy Pelosi about the uh, Obamacare uh, Affordable Care Act. You're saying that's also what's being told about these uh, trade pacts as well. Yes, yes. And we all and we all remember Dunnigan how how your how your uh, Obamacare was sold to the people that you know uh, that health care was either going to be free or or you know or it would be less expensive. Uh, you'd get to keep your own doctor if you wanted, and we and we all so and we all know how it's worked out. Uh, you know, it, it's not not only is it not free or cheaper. Uh, people's premiums have doubled and tripled, and with with more increases uh, uh, due to come. Um, and and you know you can't keep your own doctor. And uh, you see, uh, the reality is most of what the globalist tells us uh, it, it's it's false, you know, and it's 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 a lie, and it's uh, it's it's to get us to buy in. But you know, the thing is, you can only fool people so many times. You know, and and the globalists have gone to that well maybe too, maybe now too many times, and people now realize that you know when they're when they're dealing with these globalists, uh, they're they're not going to get a fair shake. And let's just say fifty two percent of Brightons felt that way last Friday, and they just said enough. So they're going to have a lot of trouble backtracking on this and making it go the other way. Now, that's my view. And do you also, as you mentioned, that fires will break out elsewhere. Do you see particular uh, most likely locations? And do you have any personal opinions about what kind of timeline is, is most likely for additional uh, nations to, to basically reclaim their sovereignty in this way? Uh, listen, I, in, in that regard, I will defer to people who, who have been involved in geopolitics uh, uh, with rich histories the likes of uh, a frequent guest on Alex Jones' show, uh, Dr. Steve Pachanik, who was uh, characterizing uh, uh, in the aftermath of, of the Brexit vote, and he just said that there, the, the you know there there are many there are many spots in the European theater where he he anticipates there's going to be uh, uh, secessionist uh, uh, fervor. Uh, he, he singled out uh, a, a few spots in particular. He thought there were going to be secessionist uh, 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 fervor in, in Spain. He felt there could be could easily be uh, the same in uh, uh, in Belgium. Um, uh, he he suggested that Italy could uh, could un, could have some issues uh, going down the road. And there was also there's also the uh, uh, there's also talk within now now within Britain that the uh, uh, that Scotland may may reconsider whether it wants to remain part of uh, uh, of, of, of Britain because the Scots apparently voted very heavily in favor of staying in the European Union and they're upset that that you know that Britain as a whole is, is going to leave and then you got and then you've got and then you got Ireland look there's there's plenty there's plenty of pent up um, uh, sentiment, uh, nationalist sentiment in many European countries right now, and there's a great deal of skepticism about the way that the European uh, U- Union has been conducting itself. And just remember, it's the European Union's European Central Bank that have been printing money like banshees, uh, buying buying up. Uh, sovereign debt, uh, uh, making interest rates negative, which has been very punishing on anybody who does the prudent thing, uh, like saving money. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our financial world has been turned upside down with the, uh, with reckless, irresponsible central banking. And reckless, irresponsible central banking is the is is the it's the real guts or it's the hammer of the globalists to get their way because money is power and uh, the ability to create money uh, is basically giving people the power of God, and and these people are sick of it because people know people intuitively know uh, Dunnigan when they're getting screwed. 
and a lot of people have been screwed. I did want to follow up with you on on one additional question. Since you do analyze the uh, activity and fundamentals and, and major driving forces in the precious metals markets, gold in particular, but as well as others, we've certainly seen... Uh, a different behavior in the last uh, month out of both gold and silver uh, is bouncing off of or finding support at recent levels and uh, threatening to break through uh, what was overhead resistance. From your analysis, do you, do, first of all, do you see that this is directly uh, a outcome of some of this nationalist uprising and, and throwing off of a globalist? You mentioned that one of the globalist um, chief tools is to suppress gold and, and one of their uh, motivations. But do you, do you foresee this burgeoning uh, uh, rise of nationalism also fueling increased, uh, correlating with increased interest in precious metals as opposed to the debt that the central banks have been feeding us? Uh, to answer that, I will say all you need to really know or appreciate is that on Friday, uh, in the wake of the uh, Brexit vote, in the wee hours of Friday morning before North American markets opened, the price of gold had jumped within pennies of being up $100 from the day before. And then the, then the, globalist, uh, the globalist tools, the banks that they employ to, to, uh, uh, put, to capture markets and to, and to lay the boots to markets when they want to, uh, the gold open interest on the COMEX exchange in New York on Friday, the open interest grew by 50,000 contracts in one day, absolutely unprecedented increase in open interest. It's never occurred before. And it, and it, and it illustrates the degree and how much brute naked short selling the, the, the clown globalists had to employ to the, the, I mean, the globalists on Friday with the amount, with the amount of open interest increase and naked selling of gold futures on the COMEX exchange erected a huge neon sign that says fraud here with a big arrow pointing to the, to the top of their pointy heads. And you see this, this further cements uh, additional uh, public uh, sentiment that they're being screwed and that our markets are rigged and that we don't have markets anymore and we've got and we've got a bunch of megalomaniac sociopaths uh, in charge of our financial system. So you see, you know, where there's good, there's often or bad. There's often some good, and some good comes out of that too, because you know, if Friday was was a glaring illustration that if you want to own gold, uh, a paper contract is no way to do it. And I'm sure, I'm sure there were a lot of converts on Friday or on Saturday when they found out what the real open interest was it increase on, on Friday. Because you see, things, things of this nature are so in your face and, and the neon sign is so bright that says fraud is here that it, it, make, it converts people to say, you know what, I, I can't buy paper anymore. I have to get real gold. I need to have physical ounces that I can touch. And it, it's, it's the growing appetite for the physical ounces that you can touch that will overwhelm the paper suppression of, uh, you know, and it's not just gold, it's everything else too. But I mean, the way, the, the way this gets ended and the way it will end is when people who want physical ounces that they can touch overwhelm these paper clowns who do not have uh, adequate amounts of physical stuff to make their uh, paper suppression believable. And at some point there will be a failure to deliver, there will be, or there will be a, a, a series of critical failures to deliver physical metal against paper promises and when that happens, the whole shoot and match comes down. And when that happens, it won't be something that, that grinds out over months. It'll be something that likely happens over the course of a weekend. And, and it will occur. And when it does, we're going to wake up on a Monday or a Tuesday morning, and you won't be able to buy physical metal anymore. 
but we'll, but we will hear that the prices are dramatically and I mean dramatically higher. We can all look forward to it because we're all going to be witness to it. And it is coming. And the globalists know it too. What does that mean for the people who have been uh, selling those huge volumes of uh, paper promissory notes to deliver gold in the future? It, it's like if it's a naked short and you have no no hedge then, no protection. I mean, when the, when the physical demand uh, appears, how do you buy your way back? How do you unwind that so that big of a negative position? The way it'll be unwound, ultimately, Dunnigan, the way it will be unwound, because it's the way it has to be unwound, is the exchanges where, this, where these paper promises have been sold, ultimately, at some point, will declare force majeure, and they will settle everyone in fiat money. And then you'll have a bag of fiat money, which might as well, when that happens, by the way, your bag of fiat money you get to, to relieve them of their obligation uh, or promise to you of gold, uh, the bag of fiat money you get when they do this settlement will be worth about as much as a bag of confetti. And then, you, and then, and then you'll have no gold and you'll have a bag of confetti. And that's what's coming. And that's going to happen to a lot of people who think they own gold when they own uh, futures or when they own other things that I believe are deceptions like ETFs that, you know, that, that claim to have all this tonnage of gold. Well, I got, a, I got a sneaking suspicion. ETFs that claim to have massive tonnages of gold, I think that gold, I think there are other people in the world who think that gold is theirs too. Because I think it's, I think it's been sold many times over. So, you know, when it comes to precious metal done again, if you can't go touch it, and, it, you know, and if you can't go lay your hands on it, I don't think you own anything. So that's my view on that. And how the miners make out in, under such a scenario, I suspect the mining stocks could, could rally or go up an awful, an awful great deal. But then, then my concern would be government, governments whose finances under such a scenario would be in a, you know, a basket case. I'm sure governments would find a way to uh, uh, you know, help themselves to your windfalls. I could I could actually see I could actually see a, a new punishing tax being brought in specifically to you know help themselves to gold bugs uh, 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 winnings because uh, they, they they probably they probably uh, because they more or less do now uh, they they probably try to blame gold bugs for everything that's occurred instead of the bad policies and the money printing. Uh, no, it's very easy to scapegoat and, and say gold bugs caused the problem because, after all, we are labeled as conspiracy theorists. When we point out the fact that printing money out of thin air uh, uh, ad infinitum is a, bad, is a bad policy choice. So, anyway, that's what I see coming. What do you think would be a possible mechanism? People have said that, that outright uh, confiscation of uh, bullion metals is probably not likely door to door at the at the individual level. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that with that statement or not, but people have talked about windfall taxes on on precious metal capital gains. People have talked about um, other mechanisms. What do you see as being some likely mechanisms that could be a a fast one that could get pulled on people who've been uh, hoarding precious metals? Oh, I mean, look, from, from the mining stock side, I could see because, you know, mining stocks are all traded on exchanges. They, they have, they have, uh, they have uh, clean uh, 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 transparency in terms of paper trail. Um, so, uh, you know, I could see capital gains being, uh, uh, being, being, a, big, being a big thing on, on the mining stocks. But, you know, when it, when it comes to physical precious metal, it's you know like how do you how do you know how do you know how much or whether anyone really has physical precious metal? I mean, how do you know? I mean, they either have it or they don't. Uh, but you know, it's like but you know like where do you where do you where do you put where do you put physical precious metal? Most people I know who own physical precious metal that I know for a fact own physical precious metal uh, they don't uh, they don't advertise. So, you know, uh, 
And, uh, you know, most people I know who own physical precious metal also have good imaginations as to where they put it. So it can become a little bit of a little, little bit of a trick to, uh, <laughs> let's just say, find it. Sure enough. Um, but when it goes to actually trying to use it to, uh, to purchase something or to exchange for anything, um, then it becomes, comes to light again as people want to try to sell it back to a dealer, if they want to try to, uh, you know, sell it on, sell it on the open market, that sort of thing. It, it's, uh, some, it's one thing to sit, to sit tight on, uh, on something that you hold an asset that you hold and hand it down within your family, that kind of thing. Um, it's another thing if you want to actually then use it to, uh, purchase a home or or get some food or something like that you know it's uh it becomes visible at that time you'd be surprised you'd be surprised how many people would be willing to barter <laughs> yeah and if and if and if and if, if money has lost its you know has lost its value uh, people aren't going to be willing to take take uh, bags of fiat anyway right so in which case you know people are going to be looking for things that actually hold their value Right. And are known to have value. Well, it's a very eventful time. We were certainly, it certainly got our attention uh, as we anticipated the uh, Brexit vote coming up and then seeing the way that it broke um, was uh, both a, a bit of a surprise as well as a, a shot of hope for can the common person actually reclaim um, their, some of their future, some, some uh, you know, self-control over their life from, from uh these nameless, faceless, unelected international powers. So just uh, really grateful to have you back here, Rob, uh, looking at your view of that and analyzing it f with us and for us, and uh, know that we have you in our corner on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you again for, for joining us. My pleasure doing so. And uh, if people want to find out more of your work, Rob, if you could give them the direction uh, once again and what, what uh, kinds of information they can, they can get uh, working w uh, with you and, and seeking out your, your guidance. Yeah, you can find me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. Uh, I, don't, I, don't uh, I don't really write so much anymore for uh, public consumption. My writings are, are for subscribers. And uh, you can find me at kirbyanalytics.com. Very good. Rob, thanks again for joining us here. My pleasure.